At one point, the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg was a possession of the Dutch King, a state of the German Confederation, and a province of Belgium. But today, it is not Dutch, Belgian, nor German. Neither is it French, though France too would have had it if they could. Which raises a question, how did Luxembourg manage to make it to the modern world while mostly avoiding being eaten by its larger neighbours? Why and how does the tiny country of Luxembourg exist? Well, Luxembourg has been a fully independent country only since 1890, but Luxembourg the place has been around since the 10th century. First, it was a county, and then a duchy within the Holy Roman Empire, one of hundreds of similar estates across Central Europe. Then, in the 14th and 15th centuries, the noble house of Luxembourg provided three Holy Roman Emperors. The dynasty became immensely powerful, but the family's power base moved out of Luxembourg to Bohemia and Hungary. Not too much later, they died out, and from then on, Luxembourg was ruled from abroad, going through France and Spain, before it eventually ended up part of the Austrian Netherlands. That lasted until the French Revolution and the War of the First Coalition, when Luxembourg was annexed by France. Five more Europe-wide coalition wars, and twenty years later, Napoleon Bonaparte was beaten at Leipzig and Waterloo, his French Empire was dissolved, and Europe's foremost powers met at Vienna in 1815 to redraw the map. The Austrians had renounced their old provinces in the Low Countries in exchange for securing northern Italy, so instead the region went to the new Kingdom of the Netherlands headed by William I of Orange. All of it that was except for Luxembourg. Located right between France, the Low Countries, and the German Confederation, the territory, and more important to the great powers, the impressive fortress of Luxembourg City, sat at a strategically important crossroads. That was one of two reasons why the next hundred years were probably the most precarious in Luxembourg's history. The other thing was the development of nationality and nationalism at home and abroad. The Congress of the Great Powers at Vienna in 1815 decreed that Luxembourg would go into personal union with the Netherlands. The duchy was elevated to a grand duchy, and William I was made both the Netherlands' king and Luxembourg's grand duke, but the two states technically were kept separate. At the same time, Luxembourg alone became a member of the German Confederation, a newly formed loose association of German states, and a sort of successor to the Holy Roman Empire. The president of the Confederation was the Habsburg, Austrian Emperor. The other most powerful state was the Kingdom of Prussia, and in exchange for William I gaining Luxembourg, Prussia had won a sliver of border territory as well as the right to garrison troops in Luxembourg City. The situation got more complicated 15 years later, when revolution again toppled the Bourbons in France and inspired the southern Netherlands, Belgium, to break away from the control of the Dutch king. The Belgian rebels tried to bring Luxembourg along with them, and most of it did side against the Dutch. It was declared to be the Belgian province of Luxembourg in 1831, and only the fortress capital, with its Prussian protection, was held onto by loyal Orangists. To get a handle on the revolution, the great powers met in London, and eventually decided that Belgium would get to live, but not keep Luxembourg. Not all of it, at least. The Western Two Thirds was mostly French speaking, and it stayed a Belgian province, which to this day is larger than the country with which it shares its name. The East was returned to William I, though he wasn't all that grateful. In its modern borders from 1839 onwards, and with revolutionary ideas put to bed for now, the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg entered into a period of constitutional and cultural development. The population stood at about 180,000 people, most of whom were Catholic and spoke a Western dialect of German, Luxembourgish. It was also common to speak French. They were united by the fact that they all paid tax to a man who didn't speak their language or follow their religion, and who lived in another country. Luxembourgers of the mid-19th century were not clearly a nation of their own, though. 
European nationalism, meaning a sense of belonging to a cultural community beyond just one city or region, was on the rise at the time, but it wasn't inevitable that Luxembourgian would develop into its own nationality. The Luxembourgers had been lumped together to serve the interests of long-dead feudal nobles and further the machinations of much more powerful countries. The same could be said of most of the other states in the German Confederation, and they didn't control their own destinies either, eventually being brought together as the German Empire. Politics abroad would prevent Luxembourg from going that way. Meanwhile, at home, the Grand Duchy achieved a degree of self-rule when Luxembourg was given a constitution inspired by the Belgian model. It was made much stronger after a revolt in 1848. By the turn of the century, the Luxembourgish dialect was beginning to be considered a language of its own and was growing in influence. Luxembourg had become a fully-fledged democratic constitutional monarchy, and its people were beginning to assert a wholly separate national identity, neither German nor Belgian nor French. But in the intervening decades, their neighbours still coveted the tiny territory. Come the 1860s, Luxembourg was still linked to the Netherlands in the German Confederation and it had spent a decade as a part of Belgium. It had also gotten closer to Germany by joining the Prussian-led Zollverein, a customs union. On its other side, though, it was in the sights of Napoleon III's restored French Empire. Those two powers were on a collision course for reasons much greater than just Luxembourg. Prussia was on the rise in Germany, while Napoleon III, in emulation of his uncle's ambition, if not his skill, saw all of the land west of the River Rhine as part of France's natural and rightful sphere. Things came to a head in 1866 when Prussia and her allies defeated and humiliated Austria. The Seven Weeks' War had seen the German Confederation be destroyed after it split into Prussian and Austrian warring camps. Luxembourg was one of the few neutral members. In victory, Prussia, headed by Otto von Bismarck, expanded enormously by incorporating many of the German states that had sided against her. With Austria out of the way, some of the rest, along with Prussia's allied states, formed the North German Confederation, soon to be the German Empire, which Prussia dominated. Nationalists across Germany insisted that Bismarck include Luxembourg within their burgeoning state, but he had vaguely indicated to the French that Prussia might accept their hegemony in the Low Countries should France remain neutral in a war with Austria, which the French did. In 1867, the Luxembourg Crisis kicked off when Napoleon III offered to buy Luxembourg from the Dutch king. Emboldened by Prussia's military success, Bismarck objected to France's proposal, and so, to avoid war, once more the great powers gathered in London to debate Luxembourg's future. Under pressure, it was agreed that neither would have it, ensuring a whole three extra years of Franco-Prussian peace. The Prussian garrison, which had been stationed in Luxembourg since 1815, was withdrawn and most of its impressive defences demolished. To maintain a balance of power, the 1867 Treaty of London guaranteed Luxembourg's independence, neutrality, and union under the Dutch House of Orange. That last bond was broken peacefully in 1890. King Grand Duke William III died, and the Dutch crown went to his daughter, but without Luxembourg attached. It became a sovereign state in the modern world, interestingly because of a medieval rule. Luxembourg still enforced Salic law, preventing female inheritance. It got its own Grand Duke, a distant relation of the old Dutch kings, and quite quickly dumped that particular succession law. Barring occupation during both world wars, Luxembourg has been an independent state ever since. The Dutch didn't always do a very good job of hanging on to their domains. They lost Luxembourg, and to find out how they lost Belgium, you should check out the video on the Belgian Revolution to the left. As always, if you enjoyed this one, it should be right up your alley. And thanks for watching Look Back History.